There are hundreds of circuits inside a digital computer, each type doing a particular job. Some of these circuits include thousands of components working together, so, needless to say, there's a huge number of dependencies between these components, the outputs of some being the inputs of many others. There are also many different paths a signal can take as it propagates through a system, some of these paths involving thousands of logic gates. Each gate takes time to react to changes in its inputs, its so-called propagation delay. Wires and connections also have propagation delays, so the time it takes for a signal to travel around a circuit depends very much on the path it takes. And this isn't entirely predictable. Propagation delays depend on factors such as temperature and variations in the manufacturing processes of electronic components. If a particular logic gate has received one correct input but is still waiting for another input to arrive, its output could be momentarily wrong and as you can imagine, if this isn't controlled in some way, there'll be chaos. In a sequential digital circuit, timing is a fundamental consideration. Think about just one example, a circuit designed to keep count. Each input signal increments the counter by one. Each new total depends not only on the input signal, but also on the counter's previous output. So clearly, when the input signal happens, is crucial. This is why we need clocks. With a clock, the workings of several components can be synchronised to just one signal. Rather like the conductor of an orchestra, a clock sets the pace and allows the components of a circuit to work in harmony with each other and with other circuits. The result is a system whose behaviour is more predictable. Let's consider a group of simple one-bit memory cells in a register controlled by a clock. These are latches. Ideally, to synchronise the setting of these latches, we'd make all of the inputs the way we want them to be while the clock signal is low. Then, when the clock signal becomes high, these input values would be transmitted to the latches and their values stored. But unwanted fluctuations can occur on the data lines because of propagation delays. These are called glitches. And conceivably, we can have a situation in which our latches haven't had enough time to achieve their correct values before the clock pulse ends. It's crucial that these inputs are allowed to settle into their correct values while the clock signal is high. Why? Because no doubt there's a different circuit ready to make immediate use of the data in the register, perhaps during the very next clock cycle. The outputs of these latches have to be stable before they're sampled. The data in this register has to be accurate before something else reads it. We could try to avoid the problem caused by glitches by speeding up the clock, allowing less time for them to matter. But we also have to allow time for the components to do their jobs. We have to cater for their propagation delays. If a clock's running too quickly, some components won't be able to keep up. We can also make circuits less susceptible to glitches by building edge-triggered devices like pulse latches. But the rising edge of a clock cycle is in the order of only a few nanoseconds, and again, even with very careful design, there might not be enough time for everything to keep pace. When choosing a clock frequency that would allow this register to function correctly, an engineer has to think about all of the circuitry involved in generating the inputs. The clock period must be such that all of the other circuits have time to stabilise during the same high phase of the same clock cycle. As I said, by the time we get to the next clock cycle, when a different circuit needs to sample the output of each memory cell, that output has to be fixed. If all of the circuits in a coordinated system work on the basis that only one signal change per clock cycle matters, then their behaviour can be coordinated reliably. One way we can help to ensure that this is the case is to build a memory device that's immune to glitches. The so-called master-slave D-type flip-flop. 
Here we have a level triggered gated D latch and a level triggered gated SR latch. Both of these latches are active high. Let's put the two together so that the outputs of the D latch become the inputs of the SR latch. Let's rename the enabling input of the D latch to CLK because this is going to be connected to a clock. And now let's connect the inverse of the clock signal to the enabling input of the SR latch. This device is known as a master slave D type flip flop. With this type of memory device, we can precisely control the moment at which a group of them will change state. The latch on the left is called the master, and the latch on the right is known as the slave. The master latch reads the input value at D when the clock signal is high and latches onto it. In fact, this begins to happen at the rising edge of the clock cycle. Meanwhile, the slave is disabled, so the new output from the flip-flop as a whole is not available, just yet. Then, when the clock signal falls to low again, the slave is enabled. Data is passed from the master to the slave, and is therefore available at the output. A D-type flip-flop can be compared to an airlock, consisting of two doors which are never open at the same time. The flip-flop as a whole is never fully open, so an input signal can't pass straight through, as it does with a simple D-latch. The output of the flip-flop occurs during the next phase of the same clock cycle as that in which the input occurred, that is, ever so slightly later. The D-type flip-flop is therefore sometimes referred to as a delay-type flip-flop. Let's simplify our diagram and analyse the behaviour of a D-type flip-flop on a timing diagram. We'll call the output of the master QM and that of the slave QS. Here's a timing diagram. We'll focus first on D, C and QM. The first thing you'll see is that the master behaves exactly like a gated D-latch. Well, of course it does, because that's exactly what it is. QM follows D when the clock signal is high. Here, C is high, D is low, and therefore QM is also low. The output of the master follows its input while C is high. Here, D has become high, presumably because we want the output at QM to go high. But because C is low, this doesn't happen just yet. QM stays low for now. QM only follows D when C is high. The master is currently latched in a low state. When C does go high again, QM reacts immediately to follow D. QM is now high. Here, when C goes low again, D is high and so is QM, so the master is now latched in a high state. Now D goes low again, presumably because we want to change the state of the master latch back to low again, but because C is low, QM doesn't follow, not just yet. And when C does go high again, QM immediately goes low to follow D. But now we can see D changing again while the clock is high. Suppose for a moment that a completely different circuit depended on the output of QM being low. It may well have missed its chance to read the correct value. Suppose on the other hand a completely different circuit depended on the output of QM being high then there's the possibility that it might read the wrong value because it's reading it too soon. Unintended input fluctuations can be problematic. Ideally, the value of D should be set before the clock goes high, and D should not change again during the same high phase of the same clock cycle. Now C has gone low again, and the master is latched in a high state. QM continues to follow D, while C is high. A couple of cycles later, and we can see that the value of D is changing again during the high phase of the same clock cycle. Another glitch, not ideal. 
Now let's take a look at QS, the output of the slave, and therefore the output of the flip-flop as a whole. QS follows QM because the master's output is the slave's input. But more importantly, QS only follows QM while C is low because the slave is being fed the inverse of the clock signal. Consider this point in time. QM is changing from low to high, but QS remains low because C is high. While a flip-flop is responding to a change in its input, its output remains unchanged. At this point in time, however, QS becomes high to follow QM at the falling edge of the clock cycle. Notice that QM, the master's output, cannot be changed now because C is low. This means that changes to the input of the flip-flop cannot impact on the output at this point. Also notice that the output of the flip-flop has been delayed by half a clock cycle. Here, the input at D has changed to low, as if in readiness for another change to the state of the flip-flop. When C goes high, the output of the master changes, but this has no impact on QS, that is, no impact on the output of the flip-flop as a whole. The slave isn't listening. And soon after, we see D going high again, during the high phase of the clock cycle. But this glitch has no effect on the output of the flip-flop. At this point, we do see QS changing again to follow D while the clock signal is low. But of course the master will ignore any changes in the input while the flip-flop's new output is being made available. Here, we see that D has gone high, as if to set the state of the flip-flop to high on the next high pulse of the clock. And when the clock goes high, the master's output QM follows D. But now the input falls to low while the clock is high, and so does QM. So by the time the clock signal falls to low again, and the slave is once again responding to changes in its input, the flip-flop has ignored yet another glitch. What we've seen then is that the D-type flip-flop effectively ignores any input fluctuations, because the master and the slave are enabled on opposite phases of the same clock cycle. The flip-flop accepts input when the clock signal goes high, but only gives up the corresponding output when the clock signal falls to low. To summarise then, a D-type flip-flop is a one-bit memory device. Several flip-flops can be combined to build a register or a bank of memory. A D-type flip-flop is built by combining two level-triggered latches, which act as a master and a slave. The output of the master is the input of the slave. A D-type flip-flop is safe because it allows sufficient time for propagation delays and therefore time for the inputs to change and settle down without affecting the output. A D-type flip-flop does however involve a lot of components compared to say a pulse latch, which makes it relatively slow and power-hungry.